Uh, hiya. Uh, my, name's, uh, my name's Martin Seal. I've, uh, I've worked for PepsiCo for about 17 years. I think uh, Peggy called me a company man, actually, uh, early on, which you could probably say that. I think uh, for about the first sort of 10, 11 years of that, I worked quite predominantly on the production operational side of the business. So I got to know the business quite well. And about six years ago, I was tapped on the shoulder uh, and asked to think about leading PepsiCo's sustainability programme in the UK, and then latterly have moved on to go and work in Europe. So I'm quite fortunate that I'm actually working for uh, a, a company who I believe want to do the right thing in this area, and I personally quite believe in this topic as well. So it's, the, two, the two marry quite well together. Uh, I was doing a bit of research tonight for the event, so I thought I better, I better research a little bit more about growing potatoes. So I googled... Uh, growing potatoes. In fact, I only got to growing, and when I put the next letter in, the first thing came up with marijuana. Uh, so if I'm looking a little bit bleary-eyed tonight, it's nothing to do with the advice I took on uh, Google, yeah? It's all to do with the fact of lack of sleep, so don't worry too much about that. I think David mentioned that we, uh, we, we took, spoke at the Green Strategy event last year, uh, and I think then I talked a little bit about PepsiCo probably not being a traditionally uh, fast-moving consumer goods company, but actually more of an agricultural business. Uh, so six out of the top 10 items that PepsiCo purchases come directly from agriculture. So a few of these are on the, on the screen here, the humble potato, oranges, oats, apples. They're all things that PepsiCo buys to make, it, make its products, whether that be Capella apple juice, Walker's crisps, Tropicana orange juice. So essentially for us to consider uh, the impact of the environment on those agricultural supply chains is a critical part of our business sustainability. So clearly, what I'm going to talk to you about t tonight is, I'm going to focus a little bit more on the humble potato and tell you a story about how I've been actually working towards trying to reduce the impact of growing potatoes by 50% in five years. Now, I think David told, called that in incremental. I think it's probably, I'd say it's a little bit transformational. And if we're going to do that in five years, it's quite a stretching journey to get that way. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about that. Uh, so we set off with this uh, idea to reduce uh, our impact by 50% in five years. This was looking at our core crops in the UK. Uh, I think when we did this piece of work, my colleagues in the audience, we sat in an office one day in Leicester and we got to about, we got to about 30 being quite optimistic. And uh, uh, one of our colleagues in the room said, you know, 30 in five sounds rubbish, let's go for 50. And, and after, so it, it actually points out that in some cases you don't always know how to get to a target. Sometimes you've got to be prepared to stretch your thinking to know that there's something more out there you can get to. And fortunately enough, that's what we've actually found. So 50 in 5 really worked along one edge. It looked at trying to reduce the carbon impact by 50% in five years, uh, looking at a baseline position back in 2010, and looking at trying to reduce the amount of water that's in, involved in growing potatoes by 50% in five in water stressed areas. So we tried to focus on areas that were under, under water stress. And the, the third element to the programme is then thinking around how could we de-risk our supply chain in the future. So could we think about the impact about the, of the environment on our supply chain and think about how could we reduce the risks involved in, in, in growing, growing our crops. And I'll talk a little bit more about that at the end. So, so what, what's it all about? Essentially, uh, this, this area is a key part of our longer term strategy and it really works in four areas. So we've been doing some work just sharing science with growers. Uh, and, and this is taking known technology, but it's bundling it all together and giving it to the grower to actually give them the tools, give them the systems to actually know how to uh, grow crops and be able to track that uh, quite effectively. So there's things like a series of moisture probes that go into the soil. They sense the amount of moisture that sat in the, in the ground around the potato. From that, the farmer can then decide whether to irrigate or not. Uh, a weather system where they're able to see future weather conditions, future rainfall. And from that, uh, again, they're able to make smart decisions about whether to irrigate or not. And to the extent now that our, our agricultural team can actually go and log on and can actually look at the moisture levels in all our all our fields that have actually got these probes in. So they can actually ring the farmer up and say, probably about time you uh, irrigated your field. I, I don't think them phone calls have happened very many times this year, but, uh, but nevertheless, that, that's there. Uh, second area is then really looking at what, what things could we do to uh, try and improve irrigation efficiency. So when we first looked at the uh, irrigation spread around the field, we actually found quite a lot of conventional irrigation, particularly by pivot, by rain boom, actually doesn't effectively cover the field. 
So we found uh, uh, big areas of the field that weren't being irrigated effectively, some areas that were being over-irrigated. So we started to have a look at drip technology in areas probably the UK would have never thought of previously going and doing that. We've also been looking at new varieties. So the picture on the bottom left hand side is actually a, a picture of a field in Poland where there's two uh, uh, PepsiCo varieties running side by side. It looks like one half of the field uh, hasn't got any crop in it at all actually because of the extreme weather conditions in that area that crop on the right hand side didn't survive. One of the new PepsiCo varieties clearly was, was flourishing a lot better over that period of time. So it says actually by deploying new crop varieties is another way of then thinking around how sustainable can uh, that operation be in the future. And the last one is probably some work we've been looking at on fertilizers. About 25% uh, of the carbon footprint of growing potatoes is fertilizers. If then we can think about new low carbon fertilizers, different types of fertilizers, clearly we can reduce our impact by doing that. The, the picture here is of a product called Naturalis. It's the uh, first PepsiCo commercial fertilizer. It's been made out of uh, uh, organic waste from one of our factories in Turkey and about two and a half thousand tonnes of that have gone onto our uh, fields in Turkey to grow potatoes this year. So a great idea of closing the loop that's come from the linkages between our operations teams and our agricultural teams out there. So, we, so we've, we've been having to go at all these different types of things together uh, and they've, they've come to sort of uh, give us some uh, decent first year results. So the first year results of the 50 and 5 programme on water uh, we applied drip irrigation for the first time into some of our fields uh, particularly in East Anglia and we saw some quite significant results but around about 36% reduction in water used within those fields and about a 7% yield impact at the same time. Uh, so you can see the, uh, the drip lines being, being laid out along the furrows of, of the field, you can see the water being applied the units are quite transportable, uh, the, the pump situations, they're all solar powered. So again, it's quite a, an easy setup for the grower to actually put into the field. Uh, for the first year, PepsiCo funded this work. And we actually think after this first year, we've got a business case now that would mean the grower could probably invest in this on, the, on their own. Yeah, but for the first year, we invested in the, in the technology. It's not, it, this is not new technology. You know, clearly this has been applied into countries that have got water scarcity issues already. It's the first time we've really gone and thought through this and applied it into the UK. The, the benefit it gives you for a potato, a potato is about 75% water. Therefore, if you can actually go and control the level of irrigation to potato, clearly you control its growth, you can optimise the way that it grows. So it becomes a big factor for generating additional yield. So, so we, we, you know, first year, we're in good shape. Uh, we've also started to do some work about longer term where that could be and we start to look at water availability over the long term. So this is the a map of the UK showing the PepsiCo farms in black dots on there and showing where they are in relative to water availability at the moment in time and we start to match that versus a future facing view by 2030 around what could the availability of water look like that way around. So th this, this technology becomes quite critical when you consider that we may have to apply between 10 and 30 percent more irrigation to some of our fields by 2030. So actually, actually running with this, putting it into those water stressed areas, we think will be a real critical factor that will make sure that uh, supply chain is sustainable in the future. So where are we? 50 and 5 first year progress. In, in 2011, uh, overall, for the whole 50 and 5 estate, we've had an increased yield of 13%. So the whole combination of those different factors coming together have meant we've had 13% more yield from the PepsiCo fields during last year by working really closely with the grower to do that. Drip irrigation trial is quite good. We think we've now got a future roadmap to get to that 50% number. So effectively, we now think we can over-index on water, although I won't be committing my colleagues to that, clearly. And we, we think we're quite a long way on in terms of creating that roadmap on, on carbon. So to get to 50% in five years, I, I think that's probably quite a radical step. It may be quite incremental still. I think it's quite a radical step. Uh, I think the last point to make is the collaboration bit's probably the critical element to do this. We, uh, we have always had a strong relationship with Cambridge University Farms. We've been part of the SI platform for a while now. And actually that collaboration is, is really critical to make this actually work. The, having a direct relationship to the grower is probably the other thing that PepsiCo is benefiting from in this area. 
you know, it allows an easy two-way dialogue to happen between the grower. It allows to see shared benefit around that. It allows us to leverage some of the longer-term relationships we've had in this area to do that. It's something that a lot of, not, not a lot of companies actually have to go and do that. So, so first, first year, 50 and 5, an example of what uh, PepsiCo are, are doing on, on water. Really looking forward to the debate. One last thing, my, my colleagues in the audience, Mark Pettigrew's over there, if, we, if he'd stand up for me. He, this, this gentleman has worked for PepsiCo. I won't, I won't tell you how many years because you'll work his age out, but he's the driving force behind the programme. So I'm just the, I'm just the speaker. This gentleman's the guy who's done the work. So if you get a chance tonight, just have a, have a chat with him and say thank you to him because it's his efforts that... Uh, helping to underpin this again with his colleagues in the UK. So thank you very much.